Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Maya Angelou. I know why the cage bird sings, the international classic. Dane reads. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some thoughts from my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say, trigger warning for like sexual assault and various other dark things. I mean, she had a rough life, you know. Um, it, will, it will say so on the blurb. So listen to me read the blurb, and if that sounds like it's going to be a trigger for you, probably don't watch this review or read the book, you know. Maya Angelou's seven volumes of autobiography are a testament to the talents and resilience of this extraordinary writer. Loving the world, she also knows its cruelty. As a black woman, she has known discrimination and extreme poverty, but also hope and joy, achievement and celebration. In this first volume of her autobiography, Maya Angelou beautifully evokes her childhood with her grandmother in the American South of the 1930s. She learns the power of the white folks at the other end of town and suffers the terrible trauma of rape by her mother's lover. So let's go in and check out some of my tabs. Now the first thing I want to say is that it's very beautifully written and a lot of my uh, my tabs are going to be just bits that I thought were really, really nicely done, you know? So we get a reference to the song Were You There When They Crucified My Lord, which is a tune. A uh, really good song. Uh, and then I'm going to just read this paragraph because this is one of the ones that I think is really beautifully written even though it's not necessarily like beautiful subject matter, you know? Just thinking about it made me go around with angels dust sprinkled over my face for days. But Easter's early morning sun had shown the dress to be a plain ugly cut down from a white woman's once was purple throwaway. It was old lady long too, but it didn't hide my skinny legs, which had been greased with blue seal Vaseline and powdered with the Arkansas red clay. The age faded colour made my skin look dirty like mud and everyone in church was looking at my skinny legs. Wouldn't they be surprised when one day I woke out of my black ugly dream and my real hair, which was long and blonde, would take the place of the kinky mass that mama wouldn't let me straighten. My light blue eyes were going to hypnotise them after all the things they said about my daddy must have been a Chinaman. I thought they meant made out of China like a cup because my eyes were so small and squinty. Then they would understand why I had never picked up a southern accent or spoke the common slang and why I had to be forced to eat pig's tails and snouts. Because I was really white and because a cruel fairy stepmother, who was understandably jealous of my beauty, had turned me into a too big negro girl with nappy black hair, broad feet and a space between her teeth that would hold a number two pencil. And I just think it's really tragic, like to think that that's how you would see yourself as a young girl, you know? That's how bad the like, internal and institu institutionalised racism was. And so uh, I just thought this was, I mean, I'm not religious at all, but I, I find kind of religion an interesting topic, I guess. And now we're talking about cotton picking here. During the picking season, my grandmother would get out of bed at four o'clock, she never used an alarm clock, and creep down to her knees and chant in a sleep-filled voice, Our Father, thank you for letting me see this new day. Thank you that you didn't allow the bed I lay on last night to be my cooling board, nor my blanket, my winding sheet. Guide my feet this day along the straight and narrow, and help me to put a bridle on my tongue. Bless this house and everybody in it. Thank you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And, I don't know, I kind of relate to that because I have bad death anxiety, particularly when I'm falling asleep at the moment. I keep getting like most of the way to sleep and then I'll wake myself up with my anxiety thinking that I'm dying. So I can kind of relate to, thank you for letting me live again, Lord, even though I don't believe in the Lord. And so we get this about her uncle Willie who um, had a disability. In our society, where two-legged, two-armed, strong black men were able at best to eke out only the necessities of life, Uncle Willie, with his starched shirts, shine shoes and shelves full of food, was the whipping boy and butt of jokes of the underemployed and underpaid. Fate not only disabled him, but laid a double-tiered barrier in his path. He was also proud and sensitive. Therefore, he couldn't pretend that he wasn't crippled, nor could he deceive himself that people were not repelled by his defect. And then, basically, he has to hide under potatoes and onions, layer upon layer like a casserole. Grandmother knelt praying in the darkened store. It was fortunate that the boys didn't ride into our yard that evening and, and insist that Mama open the store. They would have surely found Uncle Willie and just as surely lynched him. He moaned the whole night through as if he had, in fact, been guilty of some heinous crime. The heavy sounds pushed their way up out of the blanket of vegetables and I pictured his mouth pulling down on the right side and his saliva flowing into the eyes of new potatoes and waiting there like dewdrops for the warmth of morning. Again, it's just so poetic and so beautifully written, even though it's covering these you know, quite heavy topics. And then we get this, I just thought it was interesting. Of all the needs that are non-imaginary a lonely child has, the one that must be satisfied if there is going to be hope and a hope of wholeness is the unshaking need for an unshakable God. My pretty black brother was my kingdom come. I mean, again, I'm not religious and I was an only child, so I used to be quite lonely, but I just found solace in books, you know? And um, another interesting thing here as well, this kind of shows you how deep the racism was. In stamps, the segregation was so complete that most black children didn't really absolutely know what whites looked like, other than that they were different, to be dreaded, and in that dread was included the hostility of the powerless against the powerful, the poor against the rich, the worker against the worked for, and the ragged against the well-dressed. 
I remember never believing that whites were real. And again, here another great example of how how bad the racism was and how it like led to death, you know? Once he heard how Mr. Coley Washington had a girl from Louisville staying in his house. I didn't think that was so bad, but Bailey explained that Mr. Washington was probably doing it to her. He said that although it was bad, just about everybody in the world did it to somebody, but no one else was supposed to know that. At once we found out about a man who had been killed by white folks and thrown into the pond. Bailey said the man's things had been cut off and put in his pocket and he had been shot in the head, all because the white folks said he did it to a white woman. And I thought this was interesting, I wish I'd thought of this when I was a kid. The custom of letting obedient children be seen but not heard was so agreeable to me that I went one step further. Obedient children should not see or hear if they chose not to do so. I laid a handful of attention on my face and, and tuned up the sounds in the church. To be fair, I guess she's basically saying she would ignore stuff that, like she would like self-censor what she was hearing, I guess. But I'd do it the other way around. I'd be like, oh, she's telling me to tidy my room. I didn't hear that. So here at the start of the section eight, there's an M-bomb here, which obviously you can forgive Anjali for, because she has a card. Uh, so I will self-censor. Stamps, Arkansas, was Chitlin Switch, Georgia. Hang them high, Alabama. Don't let the sun set on you here, N-bomb, Mississippi, or any other name just as descriptive. People in Stamps used to say that the whites in our town were so prejudiced that a Negro couldn't buy vanilla ice cream, except on July 4th. Other days he had to be satisfied with chocolate. A <laughs> great little line here. Any of the boys might have been able to beat him with their fists, but if they did, they'd just have to do it again the next day, and Bailey never held a brief for fighting fair. He taught me that once I got into a fight, I should grab for the balls right away. He never answered when I asked, suppose I'm fighting a girl. And uh, Uncle Tommy here, he sounds, he sounds wise. He told me often, Reetie, don't worry, cause you ain't pretty. Plenty pretty women I seen digging ditches or worse. You smart. I swear to God, I'd rather you have a good mind than a cute behind. And then you got me, I have both. And uh, this bit I thought was quite a cute, cute little passage. Now, no one is gonna make you talk, possibly no one can, but bear in mind, language is man's way of communicating with his fellow man, and it is language alone which separates him from the lower animals. That was a totally new idea to me, and I would need time to think about it. Your grandmother says you read a lot, every chance you get. That's good, but not good enough. Words mean more than what is set down on paper. It takes a human voice to infuse them with the shades of deeper meaning. I memorised the part about the human voice infusing words. It seemed so valid and poetic. And she got a beating and she didn't know why, and, and uh, here's when she finds out why. Mama wouldn't talk right then, but later in the evening I found that my violation lay in using the phrase, by the way. Mama explained that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the light. And anyone who says by the way is really saying by Jesus or by God, and the Lord's name would not be taken in vain in her house. That seems like a ridiculous reason to, to beat a child, but. And then Joe Lewis, uh, who was a black boxer, I think he won the heavyweight champion of the world, and it said, uh, they made arrangements to stay in town. It wouldn't do for a black man and his family to be caught on a lonely country road on a night when Joe Lewis had proved that we were the strongest people in the world. Imagine your life being under threat because someone the same race as you won a boxing match. And we get a reference to Edgar Allan Poe, or as Bailey and I called him, Eep, E-A-P. She was very well read as a child, and I think that comes across in her writing, you know? It says, old black known and unknown poets, how often have your auction pain sustained us? Who will compute the lonely nights made less lonely by your songs, or the empty pots made less tragic by your tales? If we were a people much given to revealing secrets, we might raise monuments and sacrifice to the memories of our poets, but slavery cured us of that weakness. It may be enough, however, to have it said that we survive in an exact relationship to the dedication of our poets, include preachers, musicians, and blues singers. And uh, again, this is just pretty brutal. The angel of the candy counter had found me out at last and was exacting excruciating penance for all the stolen Milky Ways, Mounds, Mr. Good Bars and Hershey's with almonds. I had two cavities that were rotten to the gums. The pain was beyond the bailiwick of crushed aspirins or oil of cloves. Only one thing could help me, so I prayed earnestly that I'd be allowed to sit under the house and have the building collapse on my left jaw. Since there was no Negro dentist in stamps, nor doctor either for that matter, Mama had dealt with previous toothaches by pulling them out, a string tied to the tooth with the other end looped over her fist painkillers and prayer. In this particular instance, the medicine had proved ineffective. There wasn't enough enamel left to hook a string on, and the prayers were being ignored because the balancing angel was blocking their passage. So eventually she goes to a dentist, and she takes her to the white dentist, and he says, Annie, my policy is I'd rather stick my hand in a dog's mouth than in a N-bombs. People are awful. She was a child, man, as well. Like, racism's bad enough but when your racism is gonna cause immediate physical pain to a child, surely you gotta stop for a minute and be like, well, maybe I'm a dickhead. And then the opening to chapter 25 here, I'll tab this out. 
Knowing Mama, I knew that I never knew Mama. Her African bush secretiveness and suspiciousness had been compounded by slavery and confirmed by centuries of promises made and promises broken. We have a saying among black Americans which describes Mama's caution. If you ask a Negro where he's been, he'll tell you where he's going. To understand this important information, it is necessary to know who uses this tactic and on, and on whom it works. If an unaware person is told a part of the truth, it is imperative that the answer embody truth. He is satisfied that his query has been answered. If an aware person, one who himself uses the stratagem, is given an answer which is truthful but bears only slightly if at all on the question, he knows that the information he seeks is of a private nature and will not be handed to him willingly. Thus, direct denial, lying, and the revelation of personal affairs are avoided. I just thought this was cool, this references some of the dances at the time. We were served formally and she apologised for having no orchestra to play for us, but said she'd sing as a substitute. She sang and did the time step and the snake hips and the Susie Q. What child can resist a mother who laughs freely and often, especially if the child's wit is mature enough to catch the sense of the joke? There's a saying uh, here which uh, that she uses to refer to someone there. The saying was, sympathy is next to shit in the dictionary and I can't even read. What a great saying. This is a bit, little bit about San Francisco here. San Franciscans would have sworn on the Golden Gate Bridge that racism was missing from the heart of their air-conditioned city, but they would have been sadly mistaken. A story went the rounds about a San Franciscan white matron who refused to sit beside a Negro civilian on the streetcar, even after he made room for her on the seat. Her explanation was that she would not sit beside a draft dodger who was a Negro as well. She added that the least he could do was fight for his country the way her son was fighting on Iwo Jima. The story said that the man pulled his body away from the window to show an armless sleeve. He said quietly and with great dignity, then ask your son to look around for my arm, which I left over there. Ha! That's what you get for being racist. And this again just shows some of that institutionalised racism and the, and the way it gets internalised. So she gets sent to a, an older school. In the school itself, I was disappointed to find that I was not the most brilliant or even nearly the most brilliant student. The white kids had better vocabularies than I and, what was more appalling, less fear in the classrooms. They never hesitated to hold up their hands in response to a teacher's question. Even when they were wrong, they were wrong aggressively, while I had to be certain about all my facts before I dared to call attention to myself. She says here when she got a scholarship, I had chosen drama simply because I liked Hamlet's soliloquy beginning to be or not to be. I had never seen a play and did not connect movies with a theatre. In fact, the only times I had heard the soliloquy had been when I had melodramatically recited to myself in front of a mirror. Well, she did say earlier in the book that somebody gave like a valedictory speech based on to be or not to be. Presumably they didn't actually use any of the speech then. And she learns here, um, to begin, one man warned me, there ain't never been a mark yet that didn't want something for nothing. Then they took turns showing me their tricks, how they chose their victims, marks, from the wealthy bigoted whites, and in every case how they used the victims prejudice against them. Again, good. That's what you get for being racist. A uh, little, little bit I want to read, read here. My education and that of my black associates were quite different from the education of our white schoolmates. In the classroom we all learned past participles, but in the streets and in our homes the blacks learned to drop s's from plurals and suffixes from past tense verbs. We were alert to the gap separating the written word from the colloquial. We learned to slide out of one language and into another without being conscious of the effort. At school in a given situation we, we might respond with, that's not unusual. But in the street, meeting the same situation, we easily said, it bees like that sometimes. And one final quote here, which I think sums up the whole book pretty well. The fact that the adult American Negro female emerges a formidable character is often met with amazement, distaste, and even belligerence. It is seldom accepted as an inevitable outcome of the struggles won by survivors and deserves respect, if not enthusiastic acceptance. So yeah, overall, I know why The Caged Bird sings by Maya Angelou. This is exactly the reason why I say that when you read books, you can sort of see the world through a different lens and through a different pair of eyes. Because obviously, I'm not black. I'm not American. I wasn't born in 1920, whatever it was. So um, Maya Angelou is able to show through her work a life that I never saw. And I think that's quite important because, as you can see, all of the horrible stuff that happened to her and all this like awful institutionalized racism, we need books like this so that we try and improve upon that. I, I was going to say so that we don't go back, but I think we still have a long way to go, you know? But yeah, I gave this a pretty strong 4.5 out of 5, I reckon. So there we have it, that's what I'm made of. I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.